Ê Ok I'd like to say a few words about 3D printing do's and don'ts because Lightwave 11bot 6 ships with expanded 3D printing file formats for export to a 3D printer. So first, some tips on modeling for 3D printing. First, garbage will not print. Do not create garbage and send it to the printer. It will not know what to do with it. I don't know what this is and the printer, chances are the printer won't know either, so just don't do it. Second, 2D geometry, that won't print because it has no thickness, no real world thickness. A single polygon cannot possibly be printed because well, our world exists in three dimensions, so should your model. So if you find something like this, what you need to do is you need to go to multiply, thicken, give it dimension, and then you're done. Now I'm going to go over here. This is okay, 3D geometry should print because it occupies three dimensional space. So that's fine. This is bad, no holes are allowed in your print because that doesn't really exist in 3D space. Again, if you find something like this, you go and you thicken it, and then you've got something that can print. This still counts as a hole. I don't care if it's almost sealed up, that is still a hole, you need to fix that. This one looks like the hole is sealed, but if you select that polygon, you'll find out it is not. That one won't print either. If you find garbage in your model, you gotta go get rid of it. 1.2 point polys, or points, just get rid of them. They're not gonna print, or at least they're just gonna cheese off the printer. This one's actually okay. Intersecting meshes, as long as both are good and watertight, they can print just fine. You're totally good with intersecting meshes as long as they are manifold, aka watertight. This one's bad because in 3D printing, you can't have more than two faces share one edge. In this case, I've got an edge that four faces are sharing right over here. So what you're gonna have to do is either cut that piece off and move it away, or have it intersect with geometry. But either way, this thing just isn't gonna print. This one looks like all sides where all edges are only sharing, uh, it looks like it's good, except that you select this in the middle and you find out that there are edges here that actually have three polygons attached. So you have to delete that, that's just bad. This is still bad. It looks good from the outside here, and then you go here and you find out there's a floating polygon in the middle. You've got to get rid of those. Just clean up the mesh. This one looks fine. There doesn't seem to be anything mysterious about this at all. It looks like it has six faces until you select this one and find out it actually has seven. If you have a piece of geometry where you have multiple polygons that have drawn themselves over the same set of points in the sense that it looks like one point, two points, three points, four points, there's four points here, and yet you have two polygons drawn over there that use the same exact set of points. The way you get rid of that, you hit Shift-I to unify to get rid of the redundant polygon, and then it's all cleaned up. So just make sure that that kind of garbage is not in your model. If you don't want it, it's gonna just mess up your print. This is actually how it should go to the printer. After you're sure it's watertight, it needs to be tripled. So tripled sealed geometry should print just fine. So this is what you would actually send to the printer. So, a couple of addendums here. Make sure your geometry is small enough to print on your printer's printer bed. A one meter block on a 10 centimeter printing bed is just not gonna happen. Another tip I'd like to give is that even though these two structures look identical when resting on a table, the one on the left is far cheaper to print on the one on the right because this one is hollow on the inside. You'll find that a lot of prints on shapeways, they will try to make them, the artists have tried to make them as hollow as possible because otherwise they will pay a fortune in material costs. Like the, with printing, the less material you use, the cheaper it is to print. Another tip I have is don't let your walls get too thin or they will fall over during the print. So those are the general tips I have for 3D printing. And given that, I'd just like to show you two examples of things that I've successfully exported and printed out of Lightwave 3D. One is this coaster, and as you can see, everything's tripled, everything is sealed. It does have some intersecting meshes because in the real world, this floating piece would have just fallen apart because there's nothing in the real world. Uh, that's what happens when pieces are, are free floating. You can move them around in real life if they're not attached to each other. So what I did was I created this structure and it too is watertight around the edges. You'll notice that all of the ends are sealed off. 
And when it intersects with this piece, what I end up with is a piece that will, where the pieces will all stay where I want them to stay in, once it's printed and it exists in the real world. This is the object that I prepped for printing through Shapeways. You can see it to the right of this booth. And in this case, Shapeways just had a few requests. All of the texture maps had to be in either PNG, GIF, or JPEG format. I chose PNG because I didn't want the lossiness of JPEG and I did not want the 256 bit limits of GIF. So the images also had to be UV mapped onto the object. No problem there. One little bit of business is that this object is hollow. It's hollow, but in order to make sure that it could, that it would, uh, fit on this pedestal, what I did was I created a support structure, a support structure inside of this mesh. So that's what it looks like on the inside, the support structure that attaches to the hollow walls. And that way he's as hollow as possible, which means he's, I'm using as, as little material as possible. His head is hollow, his body is hollow, but this is what keeps him attached to the pedestal. And to reiterate, it's totally okay to have intersecting geometry. I did not boolean this together. This is just intersecting geometry on the pedestal. I'm doing a select connect operation to highlight it. And you can see that the pedestal, it's not connected in any way other than that it intersects with the post inside this object. So that was how I did the support structure for the alien, and those are my general tips on 3D printing. So. Okay. Sure. Well, as long as I'm up here, I'd like to go through a couple other nice little things in Lightwave 11.6. So. For folks who missed my presentation earlier, Lightwave has a spiffy new spline control feature. And the way that works is you have a hierarchy of objects and the, the root of the hierarchy is fed as the, as the spline object to a camera. And what it does is once, if nothing references that hierarchy as a spline, it's just a collection of null objects and the camera moves straight on the Z. When the camera references this root of the hierarchy as its spline item, what it does is it, it analyzes the order in which the items of, in which the children appear, draws a line through them, and then the camera's Z position is remapped to a distance traveled along the spline. Naming conventions do not matter. It still works even if you give it the most ridiculous names possible. Another tip I'd like to give about spline control is that when it goes after the children of the hierarchy, it actually goes after the leaf children of that hierarchy. These would be these items that have no children of their own. The intention of this is that if you want, you could set up puppet controls within this spline just through the use of hierarchy. Because this has children, it's not considered a node. Because this has children, it's not considered a node. But because these items do not have children of their own, they are the nodes of the spline, of this virtual spline. I'd like to point out that any child item can be a spline, or it can be the node of a spline. If the, again, if the camera is, if this object is not, it, referenced as a spline item in any way, then the spline does not appear. Once the item is referenced as a spline, the spline will appear. And in this case, these child items are, are the points one, two, three, and four on the spline in the order of their appearance in the hierarchy. Node orientation matters. If you want to twist the spline, what you do is you bank the null and you twist the path. 
This is probably important if you're setting up a roller coaster. You have the option of open and closed splines. Woohoo! So you have, uh, the, you have the option of uh, open and closed splines when you're using the spline control. Again, the item must be referenced as a spline. If it is referenced as a spline, then this option will appear, whether or not it is a closed track or if it's left open. So closed open. Closed open. If it's open, what happens is whatever direction the spline was pointing in is the direction that it will try to go. Although it does put a more gentle curve on the ends of the spline. I'd also like to point out that your choice of how these splines are displayed, you can choose to have the spline display off if you just want to see it for what it is, which is a hierarchy of nulls. You can choose whether or not you have a curve only when one of the splines, a spline question is selected, a ribbon when selected, if you should have a curve on it all the time, if they should be ribbons all the time, or if it should be a curve when it's not selected and a ribbon when it is selected. And just so you guys know, the color is taken from the item color. So I'm going to make this one orange. So in this case, you're not restricted to pushing single items along a spline. In this case, I've got item chains going down the spline. Now, there's nothing too special about this in the sense that if you, if you took any of these guys and you took the spline control off of it, in this case, what you're looking at is, with that bone chain, is that the parent is moving straight down the z-axis. And the children, being the children of that parent, they are being pushed along like a series of shopping carts. So there's nothing fancy about that. That's, that's how parenting's always worked. But when you remap that same exact behavior to the spline constraint, it's still getting pushed by the parent, but now it's getting pushed along the spline path. So in the case of all of these guys, only the top parent is the one getting animated. You don't have to just use spline control for trains or camera animations, you can also use it for whips and tails. I recommend doing this by animating the nodes of the spline and leaving the root item at zero on the Z, on the Z axis. If you put it at zero on the Z axis, that in effect tells it that you don't want the root to travel any farther than zero on the spline in terms of its distance. This one's a little more complicated. You can use same as item to animate proxy objects, and in turn, those proxies could be parented to other items for greater control. In this situation, only four items are being animated here, and those are these master nulls that are responsible for these rings of same as item targets. The same as item targets are being targeted by the nodes of the virtual splines. So what this means is that you can use scale, you can use rotate, you can move it up and down, and the children go for a ride with the parent, which forces in turn the splines to change their shape. Once you have something you like, you can go to any of the children and just fine tune the animation by animating them individually. There's also nothing to stop you from doing some fun stuff by drag it. If you drag the root, the, if you drag the roots away, the, that's where the chains must follow. The chains must follow their parent, their master parent. Woo! This is a tip that I'd like to give people, and that's that items that are not bones the rotations will always be tangent to the spline if spline control affects the rotation. If you were to zoom in on that camera, and you look at the straight line down its middle, you'll see that's perfectly tangent to the curve of the spline. However, 
if you look at an individual bone on the exact same spline, you'll notice that that's not tangent at all. In fact, it seems to be pointing to the inside of the curve. And that's because with bones, bones have the property of rest length. They have a length, bones have a length, which means that if the length is shorter or longer, that affects the rotation. With, with bones, what happens is the pivot of the bone and its tip, as defined by the rest length, must both touch the spline. So I think that if you're setting up something where the ends must touch, you might want to do it with a bone chain and then parent the items to it, like say train cars, because you'll get a, you'll probably get the results that you want. If, if the items don't have to touch each other, if, for example, if you're just animating a camera along the path, then you'd like it. You'd probably want it to be tangent. If you're doing a, a biplane going along the path of this spline, then you also might probably want it to remain tangent because then you, what you see is pretty much what you get. But for a chain of items, you might want to consider bones. This is just a little tip. If you want to see what it would be like to redraw the spline, you don't have to delete the objects from, from the hierarchy. You can just uncheck them. And that's all it takes to remove a node from consideration. So if you want to experiment with whether or not you need the extra node, you can just get it by checking and unchecking an item in the scene editor. I'd also like to point out that at any point, if you need more nodes on that spline, just clone the end and move it. And that's how you can lengthen the track that you've got. So that's how easy it is to lengthen the curve of a spline, or to lengthen a train track if you need it. So I'd like to show you some practical examples of spline control. Here's one example. A bicycle chain. What I'm using is a closed loop of bones. I mentioned earlier that bones have a behavior that I like when it comes to how well they follow the track. And in this case, they actually are displacing the geometry. The bones are actually bending the geometry. The geometry in question being this item here, the chain. You don't have to hand key the, the Z position of the, the root bone of the chain to move it down the track. You can use motion modifiers like follower in order to push a chain down a track. So what I'm doing is I'm rotating the pitch of this gear and that's affecting the Z position of this bone. Because I've got a follower applied to it where it's tracking the large sprocket's pitch and applying it to the Z position. Let's see what else I've got in my... I have a few more scenes. Ah, yes, this is probably what a lot of people are going to use it for, is to animate cameras down a predefined path. So you lay out your path using these nulls, par parent those nulls to a spline, tell the camera that this represents the spline path that I want the camera to follow, and then what you do is you take the camera's Z position and you envelope the Z position so that it's those Z values get mapped, remapped to distance traveled along the track. This is something that ArchBiz artists might be interested in. You don't have to use spline control to animate creatures or to animate cameras. You can also use it for mundane things like escalators. Because when you first apply spline control to a chain, Let me show you here. First, let me show you what the chain is doing. If I take it off the spline so that it's just a bunch of items that are pushed by the parent, the way you push a, a linked set of shopping carts down a parking lot, they're just going on their own. 
When you apply spline control for the first time, it affects all of the channels. It affects position and it affects rotation. If you take it off the rotation by reverting the default to keyframes, then all it does is it pushes the XYZ positions of these steps along the track. So you get something that looks more complicated than it actually is, but it does what you want. I guess the standard use of something like this would be for a snake because they're just nothing but curves. And last but not least, for those interested, you can also use it perhaps as a solution for a bulldozer's treads. And if you want, you can use it to drive, in this case I'm, I'm using a bone chain to drive a chain of short-sided quad polygons. And I'm using that short side to align these instances to, to the chain. So if you want to use this to drive instance geometry, you can. And that's spline control in 11.6. Any questions? Alrighty, thanks so much, Jen. Awesome, not only did she give us the awesome demonstration for uh, spline control in 11.6, but also the uh, 3D printing.